Let us turn in our Bibles to our verse-by-verse study of Romans. We are studying what is really the Magna Carta to our Christian faith. As a believer, if we only had the book of Romans, it would really sum up who we are in Christ Jesus, why we are where we are, and what Jesus went through in order for us to be now called the sons and daughters of God. The book of Romans is the very definition of what amazing grace truly is. Paul, beginning in the book of Romans, starts off by defining the power of the gospel in Christ Jesus. He begins by telling us in verse number 16 of chapter 1 in Romans that he is not ashamed of the gospel. That's where our faith should begin. That we too can say as believers in Jesus Christ that we are not ashamed of the gospel. Amen. 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 Why is Paul not ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Verse 16 in chapter 1 of Romans. He says, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Without the gospel there is no salvation. Without salvation all of humanity is lost. In sin. Some very powerful words comes after this, and this should cut you to your heart. This deals with each and every individual. For it is a power, he says, of God unto salvation, verse 16, to everyone who believes. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't. Sh- save everyone, it saves everyone who believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the pill that is the antidote to illness. You you, you can't be cured unless you take the pill. Amen? The gospel is a cure from death, from eternal death, from the wrath of God unto eternal death. It is a cure, but you can't have a cure until you take in the gospel of Jesus Christ, until you believe in it. Amen? Amen? So the gospel of Jesus Christ isn't for everyone. It is for everyone who believes it. Amen. Unto salvation. He then says to the Jew first and also to the Greek, I know you're saying, Pastor, I thought we passed this a couple of weeks ago. Well, we did. But you can't have enough for the gospel. Amen? Amen? Let us begin by reading our passages of the day. And we will focus on verse 23 through 25. But let us start in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. And unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen. Being understood through what has been made. So that... They are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations. And their foolish hearts was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. And of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, because of this, therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. 
so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. As we begin to get into this study, we know the first few verses that we have covered, verse 18 through verse 23, is God revealing himself to mankind. God revealed himself and is revealing himself to humanity as we speak. We can see God in all things. We can see God in the weather. We can see, we, we can see God when the sun rises and we can see God when the sun sets. We can see God as he hangs the moon in orbit. The very moon that we just look at and don't think much about. We can see God in all things, in all nature. And when God revealed himself to mankind, he revealed himself to ungodly individuals and unrighteous individuals. Understand, we weren't born good. And this world talks about how man is inherently good. God tells us that man is inherently evil. Man is inherently sinful. So when people ask all the time, when people ask when things go bad, they ask, why does this happen? Why would somebody do this? We need to ask ourselves, why isn't more of this stuff happening? Because man is inherently ungodly. Man is inherently unrighteous. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. You understand all means all. <laughs> not most, not some, but all is everyone has fallen short of God's glory. And when we get into Romans chapter 1 through chapter 3, Paul begins to describe that man without the gospel that he is not ashamed of, man without the gospel is hopeless. We can't dig ourselves out of the trench. We can't pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. We can't help ourselves. We need a divine intervention. And that divine intervention is God through the power of the cross. Amen. The gospel is the only way. Or it is only the gospel that saves. He says to us in verse 19 through 21, Because that which is known about God is evident to them, evident to God unrighteous and ungodly people of verse 18 because of which the, that, that God is evident to them since the creation of the world he has been visible through invisible attributes of God his holiness, his righteousness his goodness has been seen by humanity this is why humanity can say I don't believe in God but I believe in a higher power and I have to remind them that is God <laughs> that higher power you see the, the higher source or whatever they, they, they talk about it is God manifesting himself and in his, in his invisible attributes to a fallen world his eternal power and divine nature is clearly seen because they knew God and they don't honor God it is not in our capacity to honor God. It is God coming down to us rather than us going up to Him. We can't know God until He introduces Himself to us as God. They are without excuse. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22, they profess to be wise, 
We are taught in school about the Big Bang Theory. We are taught in school about evolution. And we think this is wise, or we think this is the, 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 the excellence of education and man's way of trying to work things out. But God said that while they profess to be wise, mankind becomes foolish in the way they reason and what they think. And this is where our lesson starts. Verse 23. Mankind, humanity, exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. It is mankind that will move away from God and build their own God. It is mankind that will leave the creator of all things and begin to worship creation. It is taking away God's glory and giving it to the creation that God has made. That is the foolishness of man. The foolishness of man is the exchange of and that exchange is coming from sinful hearts. The human condition is a sinful condition. While the world thinks man is inherently good, once again the Bible tells us that man is fallen and inherently bad. And it is man's fallen nature to deny God and find other idols to replace the one true God. And that is... The natural instinct. We see this all the way back even in the Old Testament. Let us turn in our Bibles to the book of Exodus. Chapter 32. You all are, most of you are familiar with the story of Moses. Moses delivers the children of Israel out of the hands of the Egyptians. The children of Israel has been enslaved for 400 years. The children of Israel are now freed under a deliverer named Moses. And they've seen some magnificent things since Moses has introduced himself as the deliverer sent by God. He's an individual that was able to bring forth plagues in order to free these individuals. He was able by God's hand to part the Red Sea, brothers of Scott. That the children of Israel are able to cross the Red Sea, not just cross it, but cross it on dry land. God doesn't halfway do something. Amen? Amen. They saw this. They witnessed it. They realized that God was real. Now understand the mentality of the slave... Remember, they've been slaved for 400 years. Understand their mentality. They still have the slave mentality. Although they're seeing God at work, they still have the same mentality as they had when they left Egypt. Some of us as believers still have the same mentality as sinners when God called us into sinlessness. He can give, lead us to freedom. He can set us free. But sometimes as new believers, as, 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 as more mature believers, we always want to go back to what we knew rather than what we haven't seen. Amen? Amen. I know some of you understand what I'm talking about today. So here they have the slave mentality. 
And as they cross the Red Sea, Jesus, I mean, uh, Moses is going into the mountain and he's now going to get direction from God. Well, this takes a while. In a world of instant gratification, in a world of instant information, we want things to happen right away. Here Moses is up on the mountaintop speaking to God and they're down there. He's up there while, while the children of Israel are down in the wilderness. He's up there and he's taking a long time. It's been 40 days. Where's Moses? We don't, we don't know what happened to him. Is he coming back? Did he set us free to leave us here? What's going on? So while Moses is speaking with God, here the children of Israel are getting antsy, having problems with this. They want to know where in the world is Moses. And while he's tearing too long, they then turn to Aaron, the older brother of Moses, and he said, hey, look, we need your help. We need you to, to, to fashion us a God. Since we can't see God and we don't know where Moses is, we need something we can hold on to. We need something we can see. So we need you to get in there and we need you to fashion us an idol. Why an idol? Because that's what they knew in Egypt. In Egypt, they had many gods, little g. But the children of Israel had a promise from big G, from God. But they couldn't see God. They needed to hold on to something. So they told, Mo, to, they told Aaron, and Aaron said, give me all your gold. And they gave him the gold, and he began to fashion an idol for them. As you go down the chapter, you see something very important. As they made idols to themselves, and as they were proclaiming, now this idol is our God. Now we will worship this thing, because at least we can see this. Amen? Amen. Lord says to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are abstinent people. Here they are while we are having this meeting, Moses, down there fashioning other gods. As we are talking about what I want from those people, they're down there forsaking my word and who I am. Remember, they just crossed the Red Sea. They know God is real. When times get tough and when they can't feel God. See, that's the problem with Christians. We're too feely today. Amen? Now, the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight, but we need to hold on to something as Christians to know God is real. But I'm here to tell you, it is when you don't feel God is when he's trying to build up your faith, telling you, I'm still here, even though you don't feel me. Amen. 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 We always want to feel God. We want to feel God in service. Oh, I didn't get anything out of it. I didn't feel he was with me. You had your Bible with you, didn't you? He's right here. Amen. You're here, aren't you? He's in you. We work on emotion, and here these individuals are working on emotion. God says, I should just get rid of them all. And Moses is brokenhearted from this. Why? Why would you lead them out, Father? Why would you bring them out of bondage? And why would you just crush them where they are? Here, the Lord, after bringing them a deliverer, then turns and says, he will not destroy them, but he will give them an opportunity to pick a side. Amen? They must pick a side. Those that are with God are on his side. 
I didn't say God was on their side. He said, pick a side. He's God. You're either on my side or you're not. Now, if you're going to serve me, you serve me. If you're going to serve an idol, get with the idol. Amen? Amen. Here in Romans, God said, through the hands and the words of Paul, that man will exchange the truth for a lie. He will change the glory of God into the, uh, of the uncorruptible God into an image like a corruptible man uh, uh, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. God, the man will automatically reduce himself to worshiping the creation of God rather than the creator who is God. We have to be very careful with that. It happens today as it happened in the past. In the days of Moses. We want to fill our life with idols. Because we can't see God. We want to fill our lives with idols. Because we can't feel God. We lose. And it's amazing. Just as Moses interceded for the children of Israel, so has the Son of God, Jesus Christ, interceded for us. He delivered us as Moses delivered them. He delivered us from death. Now he says, do you believe? If you believe, pick a sign. You either worship me or you don't. You're either with me or you're not. You're either in or you're out. You're either a child of God or you're a child of Satan. One or the other, pick a side. You either believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ or you answer to God for your own sin. I once heard somebody say that in nature they find peace. That the wilderness is their church. Oh, this is my church. The Bible says the assembly of believers is where church is. Amen. Amen. Not on a campsite. Not in a boat at Elephant View. Amen. It's among other believers that have like-mindedness in God through Christ. Amen. That is where church is. Amen. Amen. Let's go back to verse number 24 of Romans chapter 1. I want to point out two things that one of the most difficult things to grasp. First thing is when left to ourselves, we will begin to fall back on what we know and what we know is sinfulness. When left to ourselves, we will be lost in sin. <clears throat> The second thing is, without God, there is no hope. Without God, there's no hope. We're taught that he comes to the door and he knocks, and whoever invites a man, he will sup with them, which means God will invite or, or God will come to your life and to your heart and ask to be a part of it. And if you open your heart to him, if you open the door to him, he will be a part of your life and he'll change it. Amen. Amen. What happens if you don't open that door? Verse 24 answers that. Therefore God gave them over into the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. This is one of the most terrifying statements in the word of God. As I read this, it makes me shudder thinking about it. 
I want you to listen to what he says. Therefore, God gave them over. You see, God has humanity in his hands, and then he decides whether he keeps or drops off. He either is, is, is in, or then he turns around and he says, I'm through with you. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. If you don't answer, he stops knocking. How many times have you invited somebody to Christ by inviting them to church? And they say, well, I will, but not this week. Or next week or the week after. What they're really saying is, I hear them knocking, but no, I don't want to let them in. I love my life the way it is. Or they'll say, I, I, I will as soon as I clean up my act. <laughs> Brother of mine here at the church always says, when we go fishing, do we catch fish that are already prepared for the frying pan? Or do we catch them and then clean them? When God goes fishing for men, he doesn't catch the good ones. He throws away the bad ones. He catches the bad ones and he cleans them up. Amen. Amen. You can't fix yourself. That's what Christ is for. There's a concept, a belief, a doctrine called Calvinism. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Calvinism is a belief in the Bible doctrine that God is sovereign over all things, meaning God is in control of everything. Amen. The sovereignty of God. That He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Of our lives. It is a belief that we, as believers, don't choose God, but God chooses us. He elects us. Ephesians. First chapter. There's another side to the coin, and it's Arminianism. Arminianism is the thought that God extends the invitation, that God gives us free will to choose whether we're going to follow Him or not. This thought is widely believed in many churches today. Now, there's scripture that supports both sides, but if you do what's called Hermeneutics, or when you really study the word and put it in perspective, you'll see that God is in control of all things. We have no control over any of it. The Bible says there are none that seek the Lord. There are none that seek righteousness. No, not one. So if you think maybe <laughs> there's a little something in me that decided to follow God, I'm here to tell you no. Not even you. God is sovereign over all things. So when we see this, we begin to see verse 25. Let us look at verse 25. First, God gave them over to their own lust. We'll see that in the Old Testament in a second. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Why would the creator move to take his hands of those who reject him. <clears throat> Doesn't it seem like grace is limited and God has a short fuse? If you don't want me, then you can't have me. And this is the answer to verse 25. They exchanged. They knew the truth and they gave it up. Metalosa in the Greek. Metalosa means that you put in place something else that has been given to you. You exchange the truth for a lie. You have the right information, but you refuse it for something else. Here they exchange the truth of God for a lie. That's mankind. All of mankind. You and I are part of that at one time. But God. But Christ. But grace. But God's mercies. The problem for the unredeemed man is this. 
This is not an equivalent switch. You can't get rid of God and go for something else. There is nothing else but death and destruction. When God takes his hands off of man and the holiness of God is not in the hearts of a person, it leads to another powerful truth. It leads to unrighteousness. And this is all that it said. If we go back to verse 18, this is the whole thrust of this passage. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. We talked about this last week. Ungodliness is not loving God with all your heart, soul, and might. If we're honest, we can't do it. If we're honest. There is not a single person in this room that has been able to love God with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their might. And there's not a single person that has been righteous enough in the sight of God. So verse 18 says, God's wrath will be revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness. But for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. If you want to get to heaven, God will judge you on two things. He'll judge you on your godliness and then he'll judge you on your righteousness. If you want to get it on your own accord. It reminds me of individuals that say, well, I hope my good outweighs my bad. And I often tell them, look, when somebody goes to court or goes to, to trial for murder, he can't walk up there and say, yeah, but judge, I did a whole lot of good things too. He then says, oh, you're not here for the good. You're here for the bad. Somebody say amen. Amen. God does not judge us on our godliness or our righteousness. He judges us on our ungodliness and our unrighteousness. And the only one that can bridge that gap is Jesus Christ. So when you put your trust in the gospel, when you put your trust in his son, then God says righteous. <laughs> and God says godly. Which makes us acceptable in his sight. The power of the gospel of Jesus Christ unto salvation. But when God takes his hands off of us, let's finish up with verse number 25. Who exchanged the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served a creature more than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. The second thing I want to dwell on is the fact that when God turns you off like a switch, nobody can turn you back on. Amen. When Jesus knocks, nobody can say knock a little longer. I'll answer later. Amen. Amen. And this is the power of who God is. God says that he gave them up to uncleanness. That he gave them over to unrighteousness. It means that he had them in his hand and then he dumped it out. It means that he shut the door on them. People say, how can that be? I want to go back to... Exodus chapter 7, and I'm going to show you something powerful. We know the story of Pharaoh. We know the story of the plagues. We know the story that uh, of how Moses brought forth all these chances to Pharaoh to let God's people go. But we don't see God's power in each and every part of that story. In Exodus chapter 7, I love the King James Version, so pardon me as I read through this version. Verse number 1 of Exodus chapter 7, I need you guys to mark this in your Bibles when I get to it. I want to show it to you. 
The Lord says unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Verse 2, Thou shalt speak all that I command thee. Don't say anything I don't tell you to say. I don't need you to embellish my words. I need you to speak the truth exactly how I tell you. God doesn't need any help with his perfection and his words. Amen. Amen. He says exactly the way I tell you. He says, I, you shall speak all that I command thee. And Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he send the children of Israel out of the land. Now, that sounds like an open invitation to Pharaoh. But God is sovereign. Look what God says in verse 3. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Tell him everything I tell you to tell him, but he's going to reject all of it. How does he know? How does God know he's going to reject Because God will not allow him to accept it. That's the sovereignty of God. That's the sovereignty of God. Verse 4, but Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you. Why? Because he has hardened Pharaoh's heart. A couple more examples. Let's go to verse 13 of chapter 7. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Verse 22, when the plagues of blood happened and the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. Verse 15 of chapter 8, when there's a plague of frogs, but when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart. Verse 19, then the magicians of the plague of lice said unto Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Now even his own magicians are saying, you better listen. It's the finger of God. This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Well, that's coincidence. Well, let's look at verse number 32. And Pharaoh's heart, and Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time. Also, neither would he let the people go. <clears throat> when there was a plague upon the cattle in chapter 9, and Pharaoh sent, and behold, verse number 7 of chapter 9, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead, and the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. <clears throat> verse 12, and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. When God turns it off, he turns it off. Amen. It is his hand that opens the door and his hands that close it. The invitation goes out but he doesn't knock all day. Verse 35 of chapter 9 heart of Pharaoh was hard. Verse 1 of chapter 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, his heart. And finally, verse 20. The last straw of chapter 10. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go. God gave them up to their own lusts. Romans chapter 1 verse number 24. There is somebody in this church right now who has a hardened heart. They've heard the gospel over and over and over. They know the truth, but they have exchanged it for the lie. The gospel is of no power in their life.
but the grace of God. But God's grace, the blessing is he's still knocking. He's still knocking <coughs> them. Have you opened up the door to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ? So many people come to church and they think because their mother is there praying, they think because grandma is a member of the church, they think because the father is sitting in the pulpit preaching, they believe that they're okay. I'm here to tell you it's a personal thing. And if the gospel is not believed in your heart, then he today is knocking. Will you let him in? Or are you going to find the same fate? Are you going to be lost and never found? If he is knocking on the door of your heart, I pray today that you believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born of a virgin, that he lived approximately 33 years, that he died on the cross, not for his own sin, because he was sinless, but that he died for yours and mine, that he was dead three days, but on the third day, he rose. If you believe that Jesus died for you, then you just open up that door to let him in. If not, I pray that you don't tarry too long. Because one day, the knocking will cease. now have to answer to a perfect God about your imperfect sins or your soul. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. That the power of salvation is only through the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That there is only one way in to eternity, and that's in Christ Jesus. Not through Muhammad, because Muhammad is dead. Not through Buddha, because he's dead. But through Christ who lives. And is sitting on the right hand of your precious throne. Open up our hearts, Almighty God. That when you call, it isn't hard. That when you call, we say, Amen. So let it be. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of everlasting life is from you through Christ. Who has paid. Who has paid it in full. Master, we thank you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For in Jesus we live. Without him, we perish. In his name, we